given you guys an introduction to how we do business at Hyundai with what we refer to is our business plan on a page and kind of the thing that informs our business plan on a, on a page. Um, one of the things I think that's universal about great companies um, is that they have a very, very simple vision and a simple approach to business that everyone in the organization can rally around and has internalized. And I don't know that we've gotten there yet, but I think we're, we're making really good progress. And I'm, I'm always happy to share this, and I, and I wanted to start my remarks today with um, our, our overall business framework and, and how we think about business at Hyundai. And I would say this is something that has been in place at Hyundai in some form or fashion for some time, but had never really been articulated and, and put together. And it was probably what in 2008, more or less, that we, we first put this thing down and we've been kind of building on it and, and working with it uh, for the past several years. Um, it's something we call ABC. And um, I'm gonna take you through it as, as I build it here. Um, and the simple idea is at the base of this pyramid, um, and this is, is in a way kind of our, it's our brand strategy, which, which, which is of course then the corporate strategy. But the idea is um, the foundation of, of what we do and what any company does is earn the trust and confidence of the public and consumers, right? That's, that's what it's all about. And, and when you think about it, it's a very a rational function. This is meant to be a human brain. Um, and, 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 and we went about tackling assurance in, in a couple of very interesting ways. And, and one of them was well before the time I joined the company, Chris was there. He was there at the founding of this idea of America's Best Warranty. And America's Best Warranty was a way to tell American consumers in 1999, 2000, that Hyundai's quality was really quite good, better than what you thought. And in fact, if you bought a Hyundai, we're gonna guarantee this car for 10 years or 100,000 miles. And, and it worked. It was a remarkable success, this thing, right? So America's Best Warranty was an idea um, that kind of delivered assurance and trust to consumers. Um, during the great recession that, that, that occurred in 2008, with Lehman Brothers and after that, we added another level of assurance to the Hyundai brand promise. And that was this idea that if you lost your job, right, when the economy was going bad, um, you could return the car if it were a Hyundai and it wouldn't impact your credit rating. We would just take the thing back, we would handle any of the residual loss. Um, and that assurance job loss vehicle return program ended up being another way um, that, that we could earn the trust of consumers. Um, we have smaller items now that, that fit with this, including um, if you're a Hyundai owner, how many, can I ask, are there any Hyundai owners here? So we have so much work to do, Chris, still so much work to do. Um, yeah, Renee, I really need to sell you that car now. I gotta get at least one of you guys. Um, if, if, if you own a Hyundai and you run out of gas, you get a flat tire for the first five years and unlimited mileage, we'll come and take care of you. We'll, we'll fix your flat, we'll, we'll give you gas. Um, and we've recently um, launched something called the trade-in value guarantee, um, which comes from, from this idea that these days, consumers are really worried about the value of their assets, maybe more than ever, kind of brought on by the housing crisis. Um, we applied the same thinking to automotive. So if you buy a Hyundai today, um, we'll tell you exactly what that car will be worth in years two, three, and four of ownership, and we'll guarantee it. So if you buy a new Elantra, so if you do buy this Elantra, Renee or Veloster or Accent, um, you'll get a little certificate saying in years two, you know, uh, it'll, it'll be worth this much, in year three it'll be worth that much, in year four it'll be worth that much. And that's guaranteed on the trade-in of your next Hyundai. No one else is doing that, but it's another way to build um, confidence in the brand. So some very rational, what's that? Right. Some very rational ideas here. Um, Blue Drive speaks to um, a corporate strategy which we have, which is to be the, the global eco-leader um, in the automotive industry. Uh, but it also speaks to this larger sense that every company really needs to have these days of being seen as a very socially responsible uh, company. So this B speaks to social responsibility, and we communicate it now. We have, we have two pillars of, of Blue Drive. The first is um, this idea of global eco-leader. We are the most fuel-efficient brand um, in the industry. And Unlike any other brand right now, we're, we're publicly disclosing our fuel economy with our sales results. So um, every car company uh, discloses their sales at the end of every month. We disclose our sales, and then we also disclose what the corporate average fuel economy is for that. Uh, it's an interesting bit of corporate transparency, and we're doing that to help 
the industry understand how close we are as the most fuel efficient brand to some of the fuel economy targets that maybe some of you guys have heard. I know, I know you're not necessarily in the auto industry, but you might have heard this dialogue about the new coming very high fuel efficiency standards. Uh, so we, we see you know, Hyundai as having this responsibility to share information like this and help, and help the dialogue. Um, the other thing that, that is very important for us, and, and you might say completely unrelated, is our, is our major corporate philanthropic effort, which is um, pediatric cancer. Um, we have a large uh, focus on finding a cure for pediatric cancer. We call it Hope on Wheels. And uh, over the last 13 years or so, we've, we've um, donated over $43 million to that cause to find a cure for, um, for pediatric cancer. So the top of the pyramid is um, connection. And here we seek to, to build an emotional bond with the consumer. And, and this is really, when, when you think about what has been missing from the Hyundai brand over the past 10 or 15 years, and what most explains why we're doing so well right now, it's, it's the investment we've made in building emotional connection with the consumer, primarily through product. Um, but as, as I, I mentioned to some of you over lunch, we're making a major effort now on the retail and service uh, experience side of the business. So connection is the way the car looks. You know, we want the car to look so fantastic that you want to put this thing in your driveway. It's the way it drives. It drives so well that you want to, you want to take the long way home just to enjoy some more time in the car. Um, that's the basic idea, right? And, and that's something that we've really invested on and improved upon. And the, my, my final point on the pyramid, and then I'll stop my bad drawing, is that when, it, when I mentioned it, this, this strategy, it really is, it's a three-dimensional strategy. It's a strategy that encompasses everything we do. Um, I think in many ways, the most obvious manifestation is, you know, the products, right? But we also want to ensure that all of our communications and behaviors reflect the ABC, right? And then finally, the retail and service experience. So what we've done at, at Hyundai is, is taken this pyramid over the course of the last three or four years and kind of driven it down to um, one-page business plans for the overall company and for each division that reflect these values. So each division has um, a, a simple house, a simple pyramid with just one page worth of very, very simple objectives that, that tie back to this overall business uh, framework. It's how, it kind of a little bit of inside baseball, it's basically how we're organized and I wanted to give you that as a sense of, of how we're actually going about our business. Um, within Let me just take you to, to, a, to a typical media launch. We would bring in three waves of journalists, perhaps 25 to 30 journalists per wave. We spend a day, uh, maybe a day and a half with each one, um, you know, a welcome dinner, uh, time in the car, time for one-on-one -on -one interviews, and then, and then a goodbye dinner, often shared with the second wave that's coming in. Um, during this time, we're, we're just out there with them. We're talking to them in a very genuine way. Um, I've been to every one of these product launches for the last seven or eight years, except for one. Uh, which I, I missed my first one this year. Um, but that speaks to the, to the focus and I think the importance of, of having the senior person on the team there launching your products with the media. I think that's fairly unusual in our industry, but it's something that, you know, the strategy that Chris and I have put together, that's, that's important, right? The, the top person should understand the product and have a lot of passion for the product and presenting it. Um, a major sponsor of the Martin Luther King Memorial that, that uh, was finally commemorated just yesterday in DC. And Chris and I were there for that and um, we were hosting the, the gala dinner Saturday night, which was a major uh, investment. And we were going toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with other automotive sponsors of this event, including General Motors, who was in for $10 million. Um, we, we had a million dollar donation, but um, I think Toyota was in for two to three, Honda was in for a million, and um, our approach um, was this, and, and, and we, we always see ourselves, by the way, as a bit of an underdog. We always see ourselves as, as, as the company that has to get you know, 10 times as much benefit from, 
from any investment as any other company. It's just the way we're wired, and, and I can go into more of that in detail as to why that is and why that's a wonderful thing. Um, so Chris suggested that I fly out a day early for this trip, so we flew out together on Thursday. And on Friday, Chris had arranged uh, a day of, of media interviews for me. And we had, is it four, four different engagements over, over the course of, of the 24 hours? And there was really nothing in particular on the agenda with these journalists. They were all very, very influential, um, you know, top tier A-list journalists. Um, but we spent time with them, and, and, and interestingly, and, and much to my chagrin and, and, and at times irritation, we drove to where they were. So, you know, it, it could have easily been that they came to DC and stayed at our fancy hotel and we entertained them there. But Chris's instinct was, no, let's go ahead and slog through Washington DC traffic. And, and we did, and we got lost many times. And, and we were probably on the road in the car that day uh, for five hours, right, or, or more. It was a Veloster, the Hyundai Veloster. <laughs> it's a great car. Um, so we had these, we had these interviews, and, and again, nothing specific, just general discussion. But of course, when we're there chatting with them, we're hitting, we're hitting these points. In many cases, we're drawing that pyramid um, so that they understand the business strategy, because when they get it, they love to write it. And there's nothing that makes me happier when, when, when somebody actually publishes that in, in, in so many words. So where I'm going with this one is we made great connections. Some of these people that we were meeting with are Car of the Year jurors, um, which is very important. We've won the Car of the Year in the past. It's extremely important for the brand image of the company, and we want to continue winning it. We have uh, three of the cars, by the way, that you're looking at are Car of the Year candidates this year. We have more than anyone else. Um, so we meet with all these people. Um, and, and the last one we meet with is Saturday morning. It's a guy named David Shepherdson who writes for the Detroit News. Detroit News? And we have a great breakfast with them, and it's just a rambling discussion. And, and you know, during this discussion, we're, we're becoming closer, and we're becoming friends, and we're making this connection. Um, Sunday, um, David has to file his story on the Martin Luther King um, Memorial. And, and he has a lot of different people and a lot of different things that he can write about. But because, I think, we had taken the time to, you know, to, to buy him breakfast, um, and, and sit down with him and engage him in a very authentic way. When he wrote his story, there were, there were two companies mentioned, two automotive companies vis-a-vis -vis the Martin Luther King Memorial. One was GM with their massive $10 million investment, um, and the second was, was Hyundai, and none of the Japanese companies made the list. And they gave us a wonderful quote with, with a perfect, perfect juicy talking point that we employ 2,500 people in Montgomery, Alabama, where the civil rights um, movement started. I mean, it was just brilliant. And it got picked up by others, and it was just fantastic. And I saw that, and I said, you know, thank you, Chris. That was, that was well worth it. I'm sorry for complaining, but, but that has been, <laughs> that has been, uh, that has been our approach over and over. And and we just do that, and that's kind of how we're wired. Um, and I was trying to explain this to my wife. It, it is definitely the, um, the management approach at Hyundai to under-resource, the idea, the, the goal is to under-resource each activity the same amount, um, such that, that, that no function ever gets everything they want, right? But, and the ideal is everyone feels the same amount of pain, maybe 20 or 30% pain, who knows what the number is. And, and this is run by the finance function, and they're, they're brutal, they're brutally tough. Um, and they're, they're all the same across, uh, across the Hyundai universe as far as I've seen them in every country. And they're very, very good at this. So, you know, it, it, it the, uh, it, like right about now, we're going through budgeting for next year. And every division is already feeling the pinch. And they will continue to feel the pinch over the next two or three months. Typically, by the way, we don't finish our business plan um, until January, February for the year that we're already in. We're, we tend to do things later because we find that that leads to a better result in the end. Um, because we're closer to the time that something is needed. So we're always under-resourced uh, from a capital budget and from an expense budget point of view. And the same thing from a head count point of view. We are always under-resourced, um, and, and in some cases rather significantly. Um, and because of that, um, it, it really, and this seems obvious, I know, but, it, but it, it, it forces the division heads to first complain, and they complain vociferously always, and I always listen. 
um, and, and, and the Korean headquarters team always listens. Um, but then the next phase is acceptance of the task and then the innovation kicks in. Um, and, and we put on our thinking caps and, and come up with ideas to, to make it work. And, and there's another really helpful thing about that lean staffing, and, and I think it was in one of the readings that you guys had where uh, I always like to talk about this. Up, up the street from us, there's another company that, yes, has a slightly, slightly more U.S. sales than we do, at least for now. Um, they have 40 vice presidents and we have five. Um, and, and that's a great indication of, of the difference in, in management structure that we have. We have 570 U.S. employees in Hyundai Motor America, um, not very many at all, about 300 in our U.S. corporate headquarters. Up the street, there are over 4,000 at this other company. So we can make decisions just so quickly, and this lean management structure, this under-resourced aspect of our business, ends up being a help in terms of getting things done quickly. I mean, we, we don't have time for analysis, um, analysis by paralysis, paralysis by analysis. We don't have time for that. Um, and, and we make decisions, and I think often very, very good decisions, using Pareto principle concept. You know, we have 80% of the information, it only took us 20% of the resources to get it. It's probably close enough. And, and we get things done, therefore, I think, very, very quickly. This, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think one of the obvious answers is getting a grasp on, on social media and, and you know, how, how to deal with that. And, and one of the things we're struggling with internally is um, we have Chris running communications. We have a, a someone else running the marketing world, right? And that intersection is, 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 is a really interesting intersection that we're trying to figure out how best to optimize. Right now, we're, we're, I think we're doing very, very well because it's such a small group and it's easy for Chris to, to just reach out to Steve Shannon, our VP Marketing, and you know, as you did today on the, on the Reese Millen video, it's a phone call. And, you know, basically it was Chris saying, I gotta handle this one. Um, you know, I don't, I don't need your, your big marketing budgets to get this done. Uh, I can do it for $3,000, right? Um, so, so it kind of, <laughs> not the 30, but I think the 3,000 is better. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's one of the struggles I think that, that every company has to figure out is what is that delineation? Um, and, and we're still working it through, kind of feeling our way through. I, honestly, we don't have a strategy on it. Uh, but it's something that, in, in, in classic Hyundai fashion, you, you wouldn't necessarily have a strategy on it. You would try various things and see what worked and then keep experimenting, keep making changes until you've got it done. At this point now, primarily on the back of outstanding product that customers are coming our way and they're appreciating the product, but we have so much opportunity on this retail and service experience side. And it's been the major focus of our business planning, this, this whole effort uh, last year uh, and this year and going into next year, the, the dealer experience from the retail and the service side, that they've, they've found a new way. They've found a new model that's really helping them now reach extraordinary heights. I mentioned to some of you the, the power that, that we've achieved by launching um, this Hyundai Equus. We have a we have a, a mega flagship vehicle now, a $60,000 Hyundai that's being sold in dealerships that represent about 80% of our sales. And, and as we launched this car, our idea wasn't to achieve um, success like a Lexus LS in terms of sales numbers or a Mercedes-Benz S-Class in terms of sales numbers, but the idea was to use that car to build the whole brand and to build the retail and, and service experience for all Hyundai owners, whether they be buying the Equus, or the Genesis, or even the, the $15,000 Hyundai Accent. And I think we've, we've achieved that. And, and it's, it's, it's one of the things we're, we're most proud of these days at Hyundai is we launched this car, it's selling well, but more importantly, it's, it's lifted the retail and, and service experience for the Hyundai buyer in a way that Lexus did not achieve for the Toyota buyer. Because um, if you look at the Japanese model with Lexus and Infiniti and Acura, they're premium um, versions of Toyotas and Nissans and Hondas. They delivered islands of retail excellence for those three brands, but they left the vast majority of their customers, 90% of their customers, kind of you know, out to fend for themselves. They, they experience horrible uh, retail sales and service experiences in, in Honda and Toyota 
uh, and Nissan stores. We do much better now in Hyundai stores, our Hyundai customers, because we're selling our premium car in the same showroom with our less premium cars. Um, many people said that was a flawed strategy. We say, you're just thinking of the sales for that premium car. You're not thinking of the overall experience for the 90% of our customers who don't buy premium cars. Um, it's an example of, of, of us kind of turning conventional wisdom on its head um, and coming up with some greater win. For